Hello everyone, um, I'm Simon Thompson. And uh, I'm Steve Adams. Yeah. You've not seen me before, but I've been making some comments uh, on the TA on this course. So well done, you got to the end of the first week of the course. Um, and I hope you've been enjoying it as, as much as we have. We've really been enjoying reading your contrib contributions. And uh, seeing how well you, you're interacting with each other. That's uh, really great. Everyone's keeping it very civil and polite and uh, you're giving each other very good feedback which is fantastic to yeah. see. So that's great. We're really enjoying seeing that happening. Just a few things coming up from this week. The first was about uh, posting solutions. Um, in the comment sections, obviously people are, are wanting to get feedback, but also share solutions of, of questions that they've done. So one, and there, were, there was discussion of that in one of the comment threads. So what we suggested there was that you post a spoiler alert at the top of any post which contains a solution or a substantial part of a solution, just put in spoiler right at the top. So that's one way of dealing with it. But Stephen's got another idea which he'd like to share with you. Yeah, so we're still seeing some people saying, I want to get help, but when I scroll down into the comments, it kind of feels like a little bit of a, a minefield of whether I'm just going to have uh, a solution in front of me. And some people have started doing this using a, a site like Gist or uh, another site called Hastebin to post links. So they post their code onto one of these sites and then put the links to their code into the comment section so that if you want to see a solution, you have to actually click through to another site. Um, and we think that that's probably the best way of doing it uh, and that we'd encourage you to maybe try try those out. Uh, the advantage of Hastebin is that you don't have to make uh, like a login. You, you yeah. can just kind of get a URL and post that if, if you are against giving out your, your information. Sure. So. so what we'll do is we'll put links to those sites on the, um, on the webpage for step 127, mm -hmm. which is where this video was, was, um, was linked to. Mm -hmm. uh, so a couple of really good thorough discussions we saw. Uh, and the first one that came up is there's kind of some discussion of what exactly is, a, is an atom? Uh, and we thought we would chime in and give, I guess, our second take on this. That's right, okay. So I realize that saying an atom just stands for itself was maybe, is maybe a bit too simplistic. Um, so let me, let me try again at this. First of all, an example I've used with my students this teaching this term. <clears throat> I put the atom Brexit, with a small b, into, um, into the Erlang interpreter, type full stop and return, and what you get back is the answer Brexit. Because our prime minister has been saying Brexit means Brexit. Now of course, that's true logically, but it doesn't tell us anything about Brexit. And that was the point I wanted to make here, that Brexit in this, uh, in the sense of it being an Erlang atom, is just a piece of data. Um, but I guess in terms of saying it stands for itself, I think there's something else to say. And that is, there are no operations you can apply to it apart from equality. Um, you could say a number stands for itself, but also a number is part of a, a collection of, of data, a type, in which you can do things like addition, multiplication, and so on. So the operations you can perform on a number are much broader than the, um, the operations you can perform on an atom. All you can do with an atom is compare it with other atoms. That doesn't mean they're not kind of useful. They're uh, incredibly useful if we look at something like the shape example that we saw this week. Without the atoms saying circle and square, we wouldn't know if um, you were dealing with a circle or a square because it's got the same arity otherwise. Yeah. Uh, and so it's a really powerful way of, of separating information. So Erlang has a, a, a minimalist approach to constructs. So we build our own variant data types using tuples and atoms, as, and the first element of a tuple is typically, conventionally, a tag. So we saw that a square began with the atom square, circle with the atom circle, and so on. Um, so that's a really, that's an idiom people use all the time. When we start doing message passing, we'll see that happens a lot there as well. The kind of message you're sending is indicated by the atom, which is in the first field of a tuple. Really nicely separates your code as well, seeing this is the maybe code related to like a reply versus a delete message. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, the other thing to say, the other role that atoms play is that names of functions, names of modules are themselves atoms. So we do see them passed around in, um, and particularly when we're, we're looking at concurrency, which in the next, next MOOC that follows this, we'll, we'll be passing around um, names of functions and names of modules as part of the, um, as part of the process of, of setting up new processes. So the, the other thing yeah. that 
uh, we, other discussion we saw we thought was quite interesting is people people asking um, is this so especially JavaScript is JavaScript a functional language uh, and what what features do you need to to call yourself a functional language and I think I think my take on this is that you know, nearly every language now has functional features. Um, even, even, class. even Java. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that COBOL has, but, but yeah. you know, we can carry that discussion on in the comments. But so many languages have functional features. I think to be a functional language, it's as much to do with the features you don't have as, as to do with the features you do. So if you're in a language where there isn't mutable state, um, where there aren't uh, imperative ways of doing things, you write functions in a purely functional style. And that's how you compute from the base upwards. Whereas if you add functions to add lambda, say, to Java, the base computation model is still one where you're changing values inside, fee in inside um, attributes, and you build on top of that a functional layer. That lower layer doesn't exist in a functional language, or it, at least if it does, it's tightly constrained. It's very it? tightly constrained or, or has yeah, kind of controls on it, so it's not just... You, know, you can't just go in and fiddle with the state for free. You have to be very clear about what you're doing. I mean, you may have heard of monads in Haskell. Yeah. Um, that's the way that Haskell controls um, access to mutability. There's another language called Clean, which uses uniqueness types. Um, uh, if you're familiar with Clojure, that has a software transactional memory built in that's to use references. Yeah. Um, so, so I think our line would be a functional language is characterized as much by what it doesn't contain is by what it does. Um, and I think that, that perhaps will help clarify the discussion a bit. But if uh, you have a different opinion, we'd of course love to hear about it in the comments. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Good. So. so what we wanted to conclude by saying was um, a few things about next week. The, the key topic next week is lists, which are the, kind of the workhorse of functional programming in, in most functional languages. So we look at lists, um, we look at patterns of computation mapping a transformation along a list, selecting elements from a list, combining all the elements of a list. And these map and filter and, and reduce are very common patterns that get abstracted into higher order functions, functions that take functions as arguments. So we'll introduce those next week and say more about them in the final third week of the course. And the, the other thing is kind of we're having two additional, I guess two different types of steps that you won't have seen before. Uh, so there's a, a test next week, which uh, key, the key thing about the test is it's much like a quiz, but you only have, I think, two you have limited tries yeah. on, on answering it. Um, and it's one of the steps you need to succeed in if you're, to get a, if you're going for the certificate of achievement, not just the, um, which is the higher level certificate from the, from the MOOC. Yeah. And then finally, the other thing we'll be doing, you'll be doing an assignment. So that means writing a program, um, and what's different about an assignment is that you then get to review other people's submissions and then you get feedback on your own. So it's a way of working formally together. So you do some programming, some other people will feedback on it and then, and you'll feedback on, on, on theirs. And then you get probably two pieces of feedback on the work that you've done. So rather than doing it all through the comments, it'll be done um, person to person. Yep. Okay, so I think that's that's it from us. Yeah. Um, and have a great week of looking at Erlang next week too. Thanks yep. very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.